this week you can learn a hundred Creator 
Sunday. 
you stand with me? You're going to need to be standing for this next part. Quite energetic. Do they have me on a tether? You're very good on a tether. <laughs> good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to the house. This morning we're going to worship together. Just as we were going to worship, we were praying this morning. And this picture I had in my heart was about the walls of Jericho. And that there's some of you here this morning. It's deep for the start, isn't it? There's some people here this morning who are really tired because you're, you're halfway through walking around that seven times. But God's saying this morning, find joy in the journey. He is Jehovah Nissi. He is your banner of victory. So this morning we're going to praise and we're going to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So Father, this morning I pray that people will drop the heaviness in this place this morning. Life brings us all kinds of things, but it's nothing that you don't know about and nothing you can't sort. And so God, I pray this morning for a spirit of joy to rise up in the house. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, church. Hallelujah! We bring joy Stir up your soul within you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God, we pray for your blessing in this place as we give you our offering this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now, you, you can come join me across the front here. Don't let Danny and Naomi get in the way. Cool. 
goodness of God, lift your hands to the heavens, lift your voice to the sky. Praise the Lord of all creation, let his name be lifted high.
we're not finished yet. Don't finish. There's this bit in that bridge, in that weird section that comes after a chorus. If you're not a musician. And uh, can you just pop up the words? If you see what I see, that the grave is empty, then you know what I know. The word know in scripture is very definitive. It's you know something. It's the same way, and we know, and you know what I know. What do I know? The grave is empty. Anything is possible. When Christ rose from the grave, that power was small. It's quite big. It changed everything. We're going to sing that again. <clears throat> Sorry. Because I think you need to know what I know. That the grave is empty. That the grave is empty. The dead can come back to life. Lazarus came out. If you see what I see, that the grave is empty, then you know what I know. Anything is possible. If you see what I see, that the grave, come on church, then you know with confidence in your soul anything is possible if you see what i see at the grave shall we as they leave can we can we make it a little groovy a little bit groovy we love that our kids have an awesome um thing to go to guys if you're new today hello it is good to meet you uh, we hope you've met some people around the room and if you haven't please do say hello to someone um, and connect with someone so yeah we want to welcome you if you're new and church it is so good to see you today why don't you turn around 30 seconds say hello to someone give um, someone a handshake a hug a high five something like that coming round Like it, groove into the groove. <laughs> cool, come. 
come and take your seats, guys. Okay, you rowdy lot. <laughs> Let's take a seat. Okay, so we've got an exciting bit now, haven't we, Gemma? We have. Very because exciting. Because we've got an amazing man coming up here to give us a little update. Yeah. Of some amazing stuff that's been going on. Where is Mr. Jim Morris? Right there, there. he is. Come on, Jim. <laughs> give him a round of applause. Round of applause. He's been to Ukraine and back, so we're going to let him share everything that's happened, everything that has gone on. Thank you. Actually, it's, it's great to be back. And, you know, we have an amazing God. And the, the interesting thing is, you are an amazing church. Because, you know, uh, we took a van and a minibus this time, and we absolutely crowded it with uh, goods to bless Daniel to bless the hospital, to bless the army. And you know, the, the thing about it, I had a message from Daniel last night because he started to unload the van and the minibus. And he said he was absolutely amazed how much stock this church and the people who are donated are given to Ukraine. And you know, uh, we had an interesting time because when, when we got to the ferry, the ferry company had given us the wrong paperwork so they wouldn't let the, the large van on, on the ferry. So we had to chase around to get to the uh, Channel Tunnel. And fortunately, we were able to get on there. Then we had to try and catch the minibus that was in front of us. And then the next thing that happened, just as we're catching up to the minibus, then the minibus had a blowout on its tire. But God was in charge because the minibus went between two trucks and came to stop on a, a lay-by where you can actually park cars and vans and you know God is amazing and I want to encourage you because um, every time I leave for Ukraine I think about all the people that are praying for us in this church and I know that prayers were being answered because all the way we were protected the weather was atrocious uh, from Germany all the way through uh, um, um, I forgot where I was uh, but anyway <laughs> wherever we were it rained and then at the border, instead of a few hours, it took nearly six hours. But you know, God is good. We got all the way down to Marganet. Oh, shouldn't have said that. Um, we got all the way down to uh, Pastor Daniel. And, you know, to see the excitement on the church, they actually changed their service. Can you imagine Pastor Danny doing this to you, saying, sorry, there's no service on a Sunday. Please come back tomorrow at three o'clock. That's what they did. That's what they did, because they wanted to see and celebrate with us. And, you know, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for everyone who donated, whether it was finance, whether it was um, medical supplies. or um, We had so many blankets and sleeping bags that were going to the army. It was unbelievable. I really believe it, we were carrying roughly between the two vans, roughly about 100 and 60,000 pounds worth of stock. If we had to buy it, you know, all the donations that came in, we stuffed the van as tight as we could. And I want to give you an example of who you are, uh, you are looking at. 1,000 people turned up yesterday at Pastor Daniel's church. 1,000 people for food and help. That's just one church. Pastor Vladimir, we were able to give $1,000 to each church that I, we support for them to help. Vladimir, Pastor Vladimir, made a parcel for every injured soldier in one hospital and gave them a gift. In Pastor Eugene, at the moment, is looking at how he can use that money to bless the people, all because of this church. I want to emphasize that. You know, you may think you only do a small thing or you may give a big thing. I don't care. The point is at the end of the day, this church is touching lives over in Ukraine. And it's an honor for me to actually represent this life church. And I want to say another thing as well. When, uh, when the command, I don't know if I said this on the last time, when the commander of the region, I think he's like a governor, they call him a commander, but he's a governor of a region bigger than Wales. 
and he called me into his office and I said, I feel that we're doing such a small thing for Ukraine. And he turned around and said, if everyone did a small thing and we piled it together, it would make a mountain. And I want to encourage you. Sometimes it feels like we're only doing small things. It could be two packets of paracetamol. It could be two packets of bandages. But as we put it together, it makes a mountain. And I want to encourage you today, all because of you, we are touching hundreds of people. 1,000 people, look at it, came for help the other day. Because now they've designated Pastor Daniel for Samaritan's Purse food distribution for the area. One hour after our team left, the bombing started again. And Daniel sent me a message last night and said, Jim, I know God's in you because you left before the bombing started. And I, sometimes I wish I was there when the bombing started because it's no use saying hello, how are you, goodbye. We represent God. We represent Jesus Christ in everything we do. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, no matter how difficult it is to get there, you people have blessed hundreds and hundreds of people. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, isn't it amazing to be part of a church that um, really reaches people in the world? Yeah. That we're not just about this building or this area, but actually we can bring God and bring Jesus to the people of the world. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah guys, I, why don't we stand? Um, I'd love for us to pray, you know, pray into Ukraine and all that um, has gone out there. But we are going to, into the next song, we're going to give our tithes and offerings. Um, if you're new here, don't feel obliged to do that. But if you are part of the church, I really want to encourage you that this is an offering back to God. Um, but guys, let's let's reach out, out our hands and just pray that God is going to do above and beyond the resources. Lord, we thank you for Jim and the team. Lord, we thank you for this church and we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have given this church the opportunity to bless the world, Lord God. And we just pray right now that um, in Ukraine, that where the resources and supplies are going, Lord, we pray that you are just, just going to bless more and more people, Lord, that they're going to go way further than we can ever imagine, Lord. We thank you that it is blessing churches and we pray for those pastors that are out there lord we pray for protection over them lord jesus we pray for wisdom we pray that you will just go before them and that they will be able to walk behind you and know what to do with that money and where to put it lord god so yeah we thank you for who you are and we just pray that your hand is on them in jesus mighty name amen for christ is my firm foundation He's the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So
can bring. You can bring all that heaviness, all the tiredness, all your anxiety, all that depression, all that addiction, all that sickness. Nothing's too big for him. Nothing's too big for him. Nothing's too big for him. Hear me. Nothing's too big for him. He doesn't fail. It's not his way. He can't do it. He can't do it. It's not his way. He always shows up. Because the rain came through it. This is you, build up your soul. The word says, stir up my soul within me, Lord. Oh, I don't know, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Because the rain came, the wind blew my house. Oh, my house was built on you. I'm saved. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I never, I will declare that I put my faith in Jesus because he's never let me down. He's faithful So I would even now he won't, he won't, he won't, he won't, come on, he won't let faith arise, let faith arise, he won't, oh. Faith arise, he won't fail, he won't fail. Oh, he sat in the mud with you, he sat in the mire with you, but it's not your portion, it's not meant where you're meant to stay. It's not where you're meant to stay. He'll help you up, he'll clean you off, he'll keep you on your way. 
You're not meant to stay in the mud. There's something powerful about the name of Jesus. In scripture, there is so many times where it says, call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved, you will be healed. And when we sing the name of Jesus, we are singing and invoking the, the most powerful name that ever existed, that will ever exist. It is the revealed character of God. It is who he is. It is his promise. It, it is his seal saying, I will show up. There is power. There's goodness. There's kindness. There's faithfulness. There is help. Some of you are going, God, help sincerest prayer of the heart. Help! You were the word at the beginning. One with God the Lord most high. You've hidden glory in creation. Praise of your glory, for you are raised. He's a 
nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a wonderful name What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, church, just a little longer. Why don't we linger around that name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. Just worship the name of Jesus where you are. Magnify the name of Jesus. Utter the name of Jesus. Come on, church, let's not go quiet or silent or stagnant, but let's worship and revere and honor and lift high the name of Jesus. Just say it over and over again. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Father, we declare that we believe the name of Jesus to be beautiful, to be wonderful, and to be powerful. We believe there's power in the name of Jesus because the person that name belongs to is not dead, but he's alive, and he's alive forevermore. We thank you that Jesus died that we might know forgiveness of sins. We thank you that he was buried, descended to the depths, but we thank you that he rose again in victory and he is still alive today. We thank you that he ascended back to the Father in heaven. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father and is even interceding. Pray on, on our behalf right now. And Father, because of that, because of the power we know there is in the name of Jesus. We believe that resurrection life is available to us today. So we pray by your Holy Spirit, revive lost dreams, repair broken hearts, resurrect shattered hopes, and may we see tangibly amongst us in these next moments that remain something in the name of Jesus to be made known amongst us today we pray in Jesus precious and powerful name and all God's people said all God's people said amen amen it's good to see you today good to have you watching in online if you're watching online uh, before you sit down whoa, 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 whoa before you sit down turn to the person on your right and say you're looking good today you're looking good Turn to the person on your left and say, definitely, you look better than last week. You look better than you did last week. <laughs> Wonderful. Great to have you in the house. And uh, wasn't it great to hear from Jim earlier? Our very own resident Christian Indiana Jones back if you missed it, uh, if you kind of didn't catch what he was talking about with vans and medical supplies, uh, Jim now has done, where is he, where is he, where is he? Is that fourth or fifth trip? That's five, that was the fifth. That was the fifth trip that Jim has led a team of people on, taking van loads of medical supplies to people who need it most in Ukraine, which is awesome, isn't it? And we, we love Jim and we thank, we're so thankful for him. Can we just honor Jim one more time? <laughs> for just being faithful to the call of God on his life. And uh, we want to recognize Mari as well, don't we? Mari, it's beside him. She stays at home, but listen, she's a key cog behind the scenes, making a lot of it happen. And we love Mari too, and we honor you for your sacrifice. So Mari, God bless you also. 
Uh, we're going to quickly get to God's Word this morning. Uh, I want to make the most of the time that we've got remaining. And I want to speak from a thought that's very real and very raw. Uh, the title of my message this morning is this. Forgiving the unforgivable. Forgiving the unforgivable. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis, Genesis, if you're not familiar with the Bible, is the first book in your Bible, so you should be able to find it relatively easily. If you haven't got a Bible with you, uh, it's okay, the words will appear on the screen behind me. But Genesis 45, we're going to read a, a lengthy enough passage of Scripture, 20 verses together, and then I want us to go on a bit of a journey. It says this, it says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near to me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him, weeping also. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and return to the land of Canaan and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can enjoy the fat of the land. You are also directed to tell them, do this. Take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. Never mind about all your belongings, because the best of all Egypt will be yours. Father, we pray you speak powerfully through your word today by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The more I read the Bible, um, the more I come to the awareness of the fact that Jesus is often less the Jesus gentle, meek, and mild that he's often portrayed to be. When you read the Bible, when you read the Gospels especially, and you follow the words of Jesus, you will find that there are times in which Jesus says things that are harsh at best and outright offensive at worst. There's a couple of interactions he has with a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees who were often um, stood opposed to his will and his ways. And on one occasion, he turned to these Pharisees and called them whitewashed tombs. On another occasion, he went a little step further and effectively called them a group of snakes. He says, you're a brood of vipers. How many people know that those words of Jesus are not often found on fridge magnets in Christian bookshops? But Jesus said them nonetheless. Not only did he have some quite severe things to say to his opponents, he also at times had some strong words 
for his friends and his followers. On one occasion, it seems that Jesus was so frustrated and exacerbated by his disciples, he said this, how much longer have I got to put up with you? I can empathize at times with Jesus. I'm not going to lie. There's times where you go, how much? I'm kidding. I love you. I love you, dearie. But he said some harsh things. On one occasion, one of his best friends called Peter, who in this instance was actually trying to be protective over Jesus, Jesus turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. He effectively calls him the devil incarnate. I heard a story once about a pastor whose wife was addicted to shopping. This is a purely fictional story, I promise. This is not rooted in any truth or reality. But the pastor's wife was addicted to shopping, and she had a habit of going out spending money they simply couldn't afford, and she would buy things, and, and they would often be to, uh, to, to just satisfy her expensive taste. And, and one day, the pastor decided he was going to do some education with his wife, and he said, you know, we've got to budget wisely. I've got to put food on the table for our family, so I understand that you want to go shopping. That's, that's a noble pastime, but if ever you find yourself shopping, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pause before you make a purchase. And I want you to say, get thee behind me, Satan. And the devil will flee from you and you'll be able to resist that temptation. The next time the pastor's wife went out shopping and she saw a dress that she just couldn't take her eyes off. And it was expensive and she purchased it. She went home and understandably, the pastor was furious. He said, I thought we talked about this. I told you, if ever you feel tempted, say, get thee behind me, Satan. And his wife said, I did. And he said, it looks good from the back as well. So I bought it. <laughs> Purely fictitious, I promise, I promise. <laughs> but the truth is, Jesus at times had some harsh words to say that were difficult to palate. But I would say Jesus said few things more difficult to digest than when he spoke on the subject of forgiveness. Peter, that friend of his we mentioned earlier, on one occasion came to Jesus and said, Jesus, how often have I got to forgive someone that sins against me. And he made what I think is a generous suggestion. He said seven times. And Jesus said, no, 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 not seven times, but 70 times seven times, inferring that really there's no limit to the extent to which I want you to go when it comes to forgiving somebody who offends you. And I don't know about you, but I think that is pretty unreasonable. I may be the only one in the room, but I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty unreasonable. Because how many people know that forgiveness is not an easy thing to do? It's a lot easier said than it is done. But there are some things that are pretty difficult to forgive. And there are some people who are pretty difficult to forgive as well. What about repeat offenders? People who keep doing the same thing over and over again. What about people who have offended or hurt your loved ones? I mean, you can say what you want about me, but touch my wife and my children. It's going to be a different level of offense that I'm likely to carry. What about people who haven't apologized? People who seem apathetic or indifferent to the suffering they have caused you. What about those who have intentionally wounded us? Where it seems there was a bit of plotting and planning behind their mischief and malice. What about those who should have been the last ones to hurt us? Those who should have been on our side. Those who called themselves a friend. Those who are part of your family. Those who said till death us do part, those whose betrayals perhaps completely blind sided us. There are some difficult people in the world to forgive. In fact, at times it seems there are things that Jesus asks us to forgive that seem completely unforgivable. And with this in mind, I want to explore this example in Scripture that we just talked a little bit about, and his name is Joseph. He appears 
in the book of Genesis, a, a book of the Bible that largely charts the journeys uh, of some of the patriarchs and the matriarchs of our faith. People like Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca. But it might surprise you to know that over a quarter of the book of Genesis is devoted to the story of one man called Joseph, this son of a man called Jacob. And his story starts in chapter 37, journeys all the way through to chapter 50. If you're familiar with the, the account, or maybe you've seen the movie or the musical, you will know that if anybody knew what it was to be mistreated, it was Joseph. Joseph, if you remember, is hated by his ten older Brothers, he's firstly hated because he's visibly favored by his father Jacob. He gets to stay inside when all his brothers are toiling in the fields. He gets special clothing, much like the coat of many colors that you might be familiar with. He gets special treatment and so he is hated by his brothers because he's the favorite child. Not only that, but Jesus, uh, sorry, Joseph is something of a dreamer. Joseph has these random and weird dreams. And on one occasion, he dreams that one day his brothers are going to bow down to him. And Joseph, as a 17-year-old, unwise, immature young person, decides, you know what? That's going to be a story my brothers are going to want to hear. He tells his brothers. And his brothers, as you can imagine, are not that impressed. Their anger and their hatred is fueled further. So one day... They seize an opportunity to take their anger out on him. They beat him up. They throw him in a pit. They are tempted to kill him, but instead choose to sell him into slavery. Then they go home and tell their parents he's been killed by an animal. Joseph ends up in slavery in Egypt. It starts to go quite well initially. He finds favor in the household of a man called Potiphar. But then one day, Mrs. Potiphar takes something of a liking to Joseph. And she tries to seduce him. But Joseph is a good boy. Jojo says, no, no. And he runs out of the house as far as he can. But Mrs. Potiphar, who's frustrated by her rejection accuses Joseph of having tried it on with her. And then Joseph is thrown into prison. And you can imagine in that prison cell the amount of anger and resentment that must have been rising up within him. He has been beaten. He's been betrayed by his brothers. He's been separated from his family. He's been falsely accused. And you can imagine in that prison cell, all that's going through his mind is when I get out of here, my brothers are going to know something about it. But then his story takes a favorable turn. The Bible says that through a, through a variety of circumstances, he, he's presented before Pharaoh to in, in, interpret a dream that nobody else could interpret. And because of this successful interpretation, Pharaoh appoints Joseph to be effectively the prime minister of the land of Egypt. He effectively becomes the second most powerful person on the planet. He goes from the pit to the prison to the palace. Isn't God good sometimes? That when we're in the midst of mire and mess and things we don't understand, God's always working out something bigger for our sake and for his purpose. He finds himself now in the palace, but his story gets even better. Because the Bible says a famine afflicts the land, just like the interpretation he'd earlier given to Pharaoh. And not only that, it hits the land of Canaan, where his family still reside. And Jacob, his dad, who's still alive, sends his ten older brothers to Egypt to try to acquire some food for their family. And guess who they've got to negotiate with? Joseph. Now you can imagine, as they journey towards him, the Bible says they present their case to Joseph. And though they don't recognize him because he's dressed in Egyptian clothing, because he's, he's become more mature in years, he's speaking in the, in the Egyptian language even, they don't recognize him. Joseph remembers them. 
He remembers who they are. He remembers what they've done. And if I were Joseph, I'd be rubbing my hands, thinking now revenge is a dish best served cold. But we see in Genesis chapter 45 that Joseph doesn't respond in the way we think he could justifiably respond. I would suggest he models to us a journey of forgiveness that I believe every follower of Jesus is called to go on no matter the severity of the offenses that come our way. He, he reveals himself to his brothers in Genesis 45. He says, I know who you are. I know what you've done. He weeps in their presence. He makes it plain to them the pain that they have caused him. And let me tell you this, forgiveness is not ignoring the truth. Forgiveness is not suppressing the reality of the pain that you've gone through. Forgiveness is not justifying it or excusing it. There is a space and a sphere to face up to the reality of what you have been through. So forgiveness is not just dismissing or disregarding. But there are four things I believe that Joseph does that I think we've got to do if we're going to truly honor the commands of Jesus and be a people who are not only forgiven ourselves, but learn to forgive others in return. And I know it's quiet in here this morning because we don't like the idea of forgiving the unforgivable. But we're going to go there nonetheless. Can I tell you the first thing that Joseph does that I think we've got to learn when it comes to forgiveness? The first thing is this. Is that forgiveness chooses not to recall or repeat their offense to other people. Let me say that again. Forgiveness chooses not to recall or repeat their offense to other people. Notice in the passage we read. When Joseph gets ready to confront his brothers and reveal who he is, the Bible says he tells everybody to leave except his brothers. Joseph decides that this is going to be a private matter between him and his brothers. He chooses not to share their offense with other people around. And I would suggest that the first sign of true forgiveness in our lives is when we choose not to repeat or recall other people's offenses to the people around us. Now listen to what I'm not saying this morning. I am not talking about issues pertaining to safeguarding. Do not hear what I am not saying in this moment. If you are being or have been physically, sexually, emotionally, exploited or abused, you absolutely need to share that with someone who can potentially come alongside you and help you in that scenario. So let me make an important distinction there. But what I am talking about are things that fall outside of those very serious parameters, but nonetheless still hurt, are real, are painful and need to be processed. There are some things, I believe, biblically, need to be processed between just you and the person or the people who have offended you or have hurt you. Let me say that again. There are some things that need to be just processed between you and the person or the people who have offended you. Because let me tell you what we like to do whenever we're hurt, offended, prone to harbor unforgiveness. We talk to everybody else about it by the person we should go to in the first place. Matthew 18, Jesus makes it very clear. You've got to go to the person that has offended you. That's got to be your first port of call. Oh, well, I just want to get some people praying about it. No, you don't. I just want to seek some advice. Listen, most of the time, we're not talking about it for counsel. We're talking about it to garner some comrades. Because we don't like people liking the people that we don't like. So what we want to do is get people on our side, hear our story, when the biblical response is to go to the person and process that pain with them as well. This is what Joseph does. Uh, at the moment, we are journeying through the marriage course here at church on Sunday evenings. And when I say we are journeying through, I mean we. 
are journeying through. And uh, we've had three sessions so far. Let's just say I am three nil down <laughs> on the other side of those sessions. I I've got some faults and some flaws that have been brought to my attention through this process, shall we say. But the truth is what we're doing with forums like that is creating space to journey through things privately. Because if you're married, you'll know this, that one of the worst things you can do if you're irritated or frustrated with your spouse is tell your parents. Because your parents, their in-laws, are going to harbor that far longer than you ever would. They're going to carry it even longer than you carry it. Why? Because they love you and they care for you. And you might want to move on. You might want to move forward. But if you've told too many people, they're going to keep bringing it back to your attention. And I think Joseph realizes and recognizes this. He shields the news from Pharaoh because Pharaoh, who has been good to Joseph, who cares for Joseph, if Pharaoh gets wind of what Joseph's brothers did, he's not going to let it lie. He's going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Joseph, in his wisdom, knows that in order to move towards a place of true forgiveness, I've not got to recall or repeat this offense to others, but I've got to process this privately in a way that I believe is both biblical and beneficial for all. Forgiveness chooses not to repeat or recall people's offenses to others. You're quiet this morning. You're only going to get quieter because number two is this, is forgiveness also chooses not to seek revenge or resent their blessings. Forgiveness chooses not to seek revenge or resent their blessings. Joseph at this point is the second most powerful man on the planet. Imagine what he could have done to his brothers. He could have had them beaten. He could have had them thrown in prison. He could have had them killed. But Joseph chooses not to punish his brothers. Revenge is not in his heart. Instead, he commits to ensuring that they live blessed. He says, hey, hey, don't be alarmed. Don't be distressed. I, I want you to enjoy the fat of the land of Egypt. I've got things in your future that are going to be a blessing to you. How many people know that that is countercultural and opposite to our human intuition and inclination? I, I need us to understand this, that you cannot forgive as long as you are still trying to hurt the people who hurt you. Oh, let me say that again. You cannot forgive as long as you are still trying to hurt the people who hurt you. Now, that's a word because we all know that hurt people hurt people. That's the inevitable response. But we've got to remember and we've got to realize that revenge does not heal our hurt. Revenge will not change the person who hurt you. Revenge will not ease the pain of what's going on in your life. The Jesus way is this is that when someone has hurt you or offended you, listen to what Jesus says in Luke 6, 27, 28. He says, but you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. I mean, are you having a laugh, Jesus? Love them. Do good to them. Bless them. Pray for them. Are you kidding me, Jesus? But I would say, actually, if we take that in reverse order, that's the route towards being able to truly forgive someone. In fact, one of the first steps towards forgiving a person is learning to pray for them. Learning to pray for them. Notice Jesus didn't say, pray about them. So many people know there's a difference between praying about someone and praying for them. God... You know what Sally did to me, and your word says that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So if you could execute that vengeance in her world right now, no, 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 that's praying about them. God won't be mocked. A man shall reap what he has sown. So if Jeff could just reap all the bad things that he's done to me over, the, no, 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 that's praying about someone, and that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, pray for them. Pray for their blessing. Pray for their betterment. 
Pray for their prosperity. Pray for the goodness of God to be poured into their lives so that their cup is overflowing. Pray that their hands are so full of blessing that they can't put their hands to mischief anymore. That's what it means to pray for someone. I don't know about you, but I don't like the idea of that. I don't want to pray that they get a new job. I want to pray that they're redundant and that through that they come to the point of repentance. I don't want to pray that they get a new car. I want to see them hitchhiking on the side of the road. It's penance for what they did to me. I want to pray they get a new house. I want to see them pitching a tent in a field somewhere. That's my human inclination. But listen, though it's perfectly human, not the Jesus way. Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you, persecute you. Pray for those who have mistreated you. That's the Jesus way. Forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't seek revenge or resent people's blessing. Joseph actually plays an active part in making sure the brothers that once betrayed him live blessed. They get the best of the land of Egypt. And rather than resent it, Joseph rejoices over it. What a model of forgiveness. Third thing, really quickly, because I'm going to get short if I stay up here talking about this for too much longer. The third thing when it comes to forgiveness is this. is forgiveness chooses not to rewind their offense or replay your emotion. Forgiveness chooses not to rewind their offense or replay your emotions. When you read the journey of Joseph, there are actually four times when Joseph's brothers come to meet him. You see it in chapter 42, you see it in chapter 43, you see it in chapter 45 that we read, and you see it in chapter 46. And what's interesting is that only in chapter 45 does Joseph confront them with what hurt him. Four times Joseph meets them, but only once does he choose to go over the pain. When they come back in chapter 46, he doesn't go over it again. He doesn't get it off his chest again. And I would suggest this, that forgiveness is only truly seen when you've got to interact with the person who's offended you all over again. What if they're still at church? What if they're still at work? It's in those moments when the evidence of how much we've truly forgiven will be on display. And here's what Joseph models to us. You don't need to keep rewinding their offense. You don't have to keep going over it and over it and over it again. There comes a moment where you make a decision to leave the offense alone and even give them some opportunity to change and grow on the other side of the prayers that you've been praying for them. We don't have to keep rewinding their offenses. And secondly, we don't have to replay our own emotions. When you see that one who hurt you again, it can bring up all the emotions all over again. We feel the hatred. We feel the bitterness. We feel the rage. We feel the anger. And whilst we can't control the emotions we feel, we can control how we respond to them. Let me say that again. You can't always control the emotions that you feel, but you can control the emotions and your response to them. We might struggle in our own strength, but the Bible says this. We've been given a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. We can control things through God's help. We can control our reactions and our responses. And I want to suggest the worst thing you can do is turn over your emotional well-being into the hands of someone who hurt or offended you. You can control that yourself. And sometimes there comes a point where you've got to choose to leave the offense alone. It's like picking over a wound that's trying to heal. But every time you touch it, it gets reinfected. Sometimes you've got to choose to say, you know what? I'm not going to rewind or replay that anymore. But I'm going to move on and move forward from it. Fourthly and finally, I want us to know this. When it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to forgiving the unforgivable, forgiveness chooses to release them from fear and remembers your story differently. Forgiveness chooses to release them from fear and remembers your story differently. When Joseph confronts his brothers, they are understandably afraid. They know what they did to him. They know the power 
he has and what he can do to them. And they are afraid. But look what Joseph does. He invites them to come close and tells them not to be distressed. And he releases them of any reason to be fearful of him. How many people know that when we've gone through something with someone, there's sometimes a little bit of us that likes that person to still be on edge whenever they're around us. We like them feeling a little bit uneasy or uncomfortable because with that, it gives us a sense of superiority and power. But that's not the model of Joseph. Joseph says, come close. He leans in. He comes down to their level. And he says, you don't have to be fearful or distressed any longer. How on earth is Joseph able to do this? I would say that he's able to do this and be so gracious because he chooses to remember his story differently. He chooses to remember his story differently. The word remember does not mean just to take a trip down memory lane. The word remember literally means to remember. It means to put back together things that have been broken and even separated. And Joseph, I would suggest, as he looks back over his life, as he starts to tell his story to his brothers, he remembers his story differently. He says, I know you intended to harm me. I know you sold me into slavery. But God was actually at work all the way through it. He actually sent me ahead of you in order that today I could save you. He looks back over his life and doesn't just remember what they did. But he remembers that God was with him. And he remembers that God was working something out for him. And Joseph, I would suggest, understands this difference. He understands the difference between a moment and a movement. See, throwing him in a pit was a moment. Selling him into slavery was a moment. Sitting in a prison cell was a moment. But behind all that was a movement of God where God was still all working it together for his good, even when he couldn't see it, even when he couldn't feel it, even when he couldn't apprehend it. He knew that there was a movement of God behind all the moments that he was having to endure. And I would suggest to forgive even some of the painful moments in our lives. We've got to put it in the perspective of the providential movement of God in our lives. You see, what they did to you, what they said to you, was just one chapter of a larger story that God is still writing. You might be in the middle of it right now. You might be immersed in pain. You might be immersed in hurt, and that is understandable. We don't dismiss that, and we don't disregard it. But what we do say is that the story is still being written. We say God's not finished yet, and God will work it together for something of his eternal purpose. And sometimes what we've got to do is we've got to go into the pages of our story and where we have put full stops at the end of statements that took place in our lives, we've got to put a comma and we've got to insert two words. And those two words are, but God. Yes, I was hurt, but there's no full stop there. We put a comma and we say, but God has brought me some healing or he will bring me some healing. Yes, I was abandoned by people, but God was still with me. Yes, I felt betrayed, but God was still faithful. Yes, I lost some confidence in some people, but God showed me to put my trust and my hope and my faith and my security in Him. We've got to sometimes evaluate the moments that we go through, through the lens of the wider movement of God that He's working out in our lives. And if we do, maybe, just maybe, We'll be able to forgive like Joseph forgave his brothers. But more importantly, maybe we'll be able to forgive like Jesus forgave us. Do you remember that Jesus chooses not to keep our offenses public, but he processes them oftentimes privately 
with us. I'm grateful for that. Are you? That Jesus doesn't expose all our sins. But the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. He processes some things with us personally. I'm grateful that Jesus chose to bless us when he was within his rights to curse us. I'm grateful that Jesus chooses to remember our sins no more. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't keep recalling our sins or replaying our sins. And I'm grateful that he releases us from fear and writes a better story for us. Perfect love casts out all fear. That's the way Jesus forgives us. And I've got some horrible, shocking, difficult news for us. The sad thing is, that's how he asks us to forgive one another. So this morning, I'm not just asking, can you bring yourself to the point of forgiving like Joseph forgave his brothers? There are some valid principles to learn there. I'm asking, are you willing to forgive the same way that Jesus forgave you and forgave me? I'm going to ask us to bow our heads, close our eyes. I realized this morning, We've been covering some tough terrain, going over some heavy ground. And I want to create a moment for the Holy Spirit to perhaps just move on our hearts for this thing. I'm wondering here this morning whether there's some people who know in their heart of hearts they're still harboring something of unforgiveness. Something that happened last week, last year, last decade, last generation. We, we, we don't need to put a time scale on this stuff. But the truth is, as we've talked about this subject this morning, you know your mind goes back to that place. Your mind goes back to that person. Your mind goes back to that scenario. And if you are honest with yourself and with God there's something of unforgiveness that still resides here I get it it was wrong it was unjust it was unfair it was uncalled for but Jesus this morning is asking us to forgive not just for the sake of the offender but he's asking us to forgive for the sake of the offender. There's freedom that comes when we release that person. There's freedom that comes when we release ourselves from constantly playing that thing over in our mind. And the truth is we can't do it in our own strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to pray for this morning. If you're in here this morning and you know that you need some help to forgive. You don't want to be bound by unforgiveness. You don't want to be bitter and angry. Could have been someone so close to you, someone who should have known better, someone you trusted. But if that's you, all I want you to do is just slip up your hand so I can acknowledge it and include you in this prayer. If that's you, you know you're still grappling. I see your hands. You know, right across this way. Put your hand up. You're still harboring. in the reality of it. But right now we're going to stand together as a church family, all of us, and we're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to help us to live free from unforgiveness and even bring us to that point of being able to forgive what others would describe as being unforgiving, as unforgivable. Come on church, let's stand together. We're going to pray. sign of surrender. Can we just lift our hands together? You know we need strength that is not our own for things such as this. Father, we thank you that your word is necessary to us. 
even when it doesn't sound all that nice. And Lord, we know that it is not easy to forgive. It's hard. It's difficult. Sometimes it seems impossible. But Father, we're grateful this morning that we don't forgive on our own, but we can forgive empowered by your Holy Spirit. We can forgive enthused by the example of Jesus, who unfairly hung on a cross, feeling abandoned and betrayed, and yet still was able to cry out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to forgive those who have hurt us when they didn't know what they were doing. But you would also help us to forgive those who knew absolutely what they were doing. God, give us a supernatural strength to overcome any root of unforgiveness or bitterness that ultimately would keep us confined and contained. Father, I pray that you would help us to pray for those who have mistreated us, that you would help us to seek to bless those who have wounded us. You would help us to process offense biblically and in a way that brings blessing to others, but also to ourselves. Father, we cry out this morning, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Help us. In our weakness, provide strength. In our lack of grace, pour out your grace. When we're at times prone to being merciless, help us to be merciful in the way that you are merciful towards us. And help us by your Holy Spirit to get to the point of being able to choose. Lord, we know we might not always feel it, but help us to make deliberate decisions. Not to stay where we are, but to move forward to a land of forgiveness that you have called us to live in. We thank you for your help. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And right now we simply call on the name of Jesus afresh and say, Jesus, help us. Jesus, who knew what it was like to be mistreated. Jesus, who knew what it was like to suffer and go through sorrow and pain and anguish. Jesus, would you help us to overcome in this area the enemy would often seek to trap us in? In Jesus' precious and powerful name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's stay standing as we worship this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope.
Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the whole. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I'll speak the holy name, Jesus, I declare, I declare, God is moving in this space this morning. So let it go, let it go. Let it go, it's not yours to hold anymore. Let it go, let it go, let it go. It's not yours anymore. Give it to me, give it to me, says God.
for everyone who has responded and I pray for everyone who, for all of us, we all need Jesus. We all need you, God. So we speak your name, Jesus, over the areas in our life where we need your help, over our unforgiveness, God. We need your help. We need your power. We need your healing every single day. God, we thank you for your name. We thank you for your powerful name. challenging but um, inspiring word for me so I hope it was for each of you and, and actually hope that it changes our lives as we as we go on the back of this we have got a few notices to share with you this morning church and then we're gonna um, praise our way out which we love to do so awesome awesome can we just thank Danny for that amazing yeah. word <laughs> thank you so much Danny for that um, so some notices for everyone. We have our shoebox appeal coming up where we are able to bless people around the world with some Christmas gifts. If you want to get involved in that, there are some shoeboxes out there with Samaritan's Purse that you can take home and fill up with any gifts or things like that. And they need to be back. Those boxes need to be back by next Sunday. Next Sunday. Yeah, yeah next Sunday as well. We've got Remembrance Sunday. So please for that is going to be a great Sunday and guys if you do want prayer for anything or especially um, things that we've talked about this morning we have always got this prayer area, uh, prayer area over here where people want to pray with you we want to stand with you so please do make your way over there um, and we will be we'll have people to pray with you so um, yeah come and join us and then lastly if you are new here today we want to connect with you do not leave without letting us know who you are and yes. grabbing a coffee with us um, and Head you can do foyer. that in the foyer over that way yes. is where we will connect with you so please go out there but as Gemma said we are going to go out with some praise we are not yet done so stay standing um, can I pray for your week yeah. Yeah. lovely yeah. lovely <laughs> lovely okay so Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the blessing of this service and your presence, God. So as we go out of these doors, may you just go with us, just empower us to go into our week and really empower um, that forgiveness in our souls um, and just keep working with us and ministering to people in our worlds. So do what you do. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Let's go. Put our hands together, church. Oh.